सो हेलो डियर स्टूडेंट्स वेलकम बैक टू बाजीरा वाई एस अकेडमी क्वालिटी एनरिचमेंट प्रोग्राम ऑफ जनरल स्टडीज पेपर वन आंसर्स सो नाउ इन दिस सेशन वी हैव बीन डिस्कसिंग अबाउट जनरल स्टडीज पेपर वन आंसर्स ओके दैट वर आस्क इन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी टू यू पी एस सी we will be understanding how we can structure the answers so how we can exactly uh, write the answers and what is the way to structure uh, for better answer so that we can get good marks in the exam so the first question that we are going to discuss here uh, in this session is how is growth of thai to cities related to the rise of new middle class with an emphasis on the culture of consumption okay so this question has been emphasizing on the rise of or the growth of tied to cities okay so with the rise of new middle class in these tied to cities so there is a, a significant or the substantial growth of tied to cities as well so because the middle class is one of the largest consumer group in those cities and that has been fueling the rapid growth of tied to cities and they are even competing with the tier 1 cities now in this context we need to understand what is the definition of tier 2 cities now in the introduction itself you have to write the definition of tier 2 cities what exactly constitute a tier 2 city now the tier 2 city as per the government definition so the city which has around 50000 to 1 lakh population is categorized as tied to city now what is the metropolitan city so metropolitan city is a city with a 1 million population 1 million or 10 lakh population so if a city has a population size of 50000 to 1 lakh it is categorized as tied to city this is the definition of a tied to city that is given by the government and if you look at the a middle class so what is the definition of a middle class so middle class is generally refers to individuals or households who generally fall between the working class or the upper class within a socio economic hierarchy so we have a different socio economic hierarchy right uh, whether uh, we are in uh, village uh, rural areas urban areas so there are different socio economic hierarchies in tied to cities so we can consider middle class groups as people or the individuals who fall between the working class and the upper class within the socio economic hierarchy so in western cultures also in western culture also there were middle classes so in western culture so middle class tend to have a higher proportion of college degrees than those who are in working or those who are in the working class and they have a more disposable income available for the consumption and they even have their own property so this is the basic definition of a middle class in western countries or the western cultures so those in the middle class often employed as professionals managers and civil servants in different they are engaged in the different economic activities within these tied to cities now in this context what is the relationship between new middle class and tied to cities so it is important for us to understand the relationship between new middle class and tied to cities so firstly increase in entrepreneurship in the tied to cities because if you look at the lpg reforms in india so that were primarily driven by the globalization so that led to the fueling or the increasing entrepreneurship in the tied to cities particularly because of the middle class now the white collar employment significantly grew in the tied to cities during the lpg reforms era okay so why because this is particularly because the increase in the entrepreneurial activity now if you look at the total startup ecosystem uh, across the world india has the third largest startup ecosystem after us and china so therefore in this context tied to cities have been paying playing a, ma a major role so one key sector 
in these tier two cities uh, is service sector. Okay, service sector is one of the most prominent sector in the tier two cities. However, this can be assumed from the fact that tier two cities have been contributing around fifty percentage of India's GDP. Okay, so the service sector in these uh, tier two cities. or uh, the overall service sector has been contributing around more than 50 percentage of india's gdp and it has been contributing to around 64 percentage of jobs okay in thai 2 and thai 3 cities alone and this is particularly because of the globalization so the lpg reforms started after globalization now after the lpg reforms the entrepreneurship activity has grown at a substantial pace and that has given further boost to the service sector and secondly because of the increased entrepreneurship increased uh, industrialization service sector in these tier 2 and tier 3 tier 3 cities there has been a substantial increase in wages of the workers who have been part of the different economic activities and recently there is a, a demand or the growth of the digital revolution as well so digitalization has been growing at a rapid pace across india particularly in these tier 2 and tier 3 cities and in fact the middle class in these tier 2 and tier 3 cities have acquired the western habits okay so the westernization habits were acquired by the people who are living in these tier 2 and tier tier 3 cities so all these factors have been contributed to the promotion of popular culture or in short we can call this as pop culture so you may have come across the word pop culture and these uh, increasing wages and westernization of habits and the digital revolution has led to the promotion of pop culture in these tier 2 cities and this pop culture or the popular culture has altered the consumption patterns of the people who are living in these tier 2 cities in general and middle class in particular so apart from that the government has also recently come up with several initiatives for the development of these tier 2 cities so the development which is eco friendly sustainable inclusive so what are those schemes the government has launched make in india particularly to promote manufacturing in india so make in india program has also centered around the development of tier 2 and tier 3 cities and the middle class will be you know uh, will be providing skilled and semi skilled workforce for the make in india program so therefore giving it a further push so make in india program was launched by the government after that the stand up india program start up india program both programs were launched to promote the entrepreneurship in the country so after that the mudra uh, mudra yojana was also launched now mudra yojana provide micro finance facilities to the upcoming entrepreneurs shishu kishor tarun so these are three loan categories in mudra yojana shishu kishor tarun so it provides microfinance to the entrepreneurs or the local vendors and after that jandan aadhar mobile trinity has also been launched in order to enhance the financial inclusion and udan program was launched to improve the regional connectivity to these tier 2 and tier 3 cities so all these factors have led to the contribution or the promotion of a culture of consumption by the increasing disposable income in the hands of the middle class in the tier 2 cities so now in this context it is important for us to understand the reasons behind the emergence of tier 2 cities so as a as a major growth engines so how these tier 2 cities have emerged as a major growth engines over a period of time in india so this is very important now if you look at the reasons firstly you need to understand so there are very attractive options for the larger firms why because these tier 2 cities have adequate infrastructure and they can supply the skilled and semi skilled workforce for them and apart from that the living standards for the people 
uh, who are living in these tai 2 and tai 3 cities are also comparatively better uh, if you look at the tai 1 cities so the cost of living is lower when compared to the tier 1 cities so therefore it is one of the most attractive options for the larger firms so recently uh, in order to attract industries the, the state governments have also focused on revamping their existing infrastructure in these tier 2 cities so because of this reason the tier 2 cities have become more attractive options for these firms for example tier 2 cities like jaipur patna indore and surat they have experienced economic growth levels of up to 40 percentage now economic growth rates of 40 percent is not a small thing so they have been growing at a rapid pace so uh, if you look at the tier 2 cities and the middle class populations with 80 percentage of the households will be having the middle class incomes in the year uh, by the year 2030 and that would significantly boost india's economic growth because middle class populations have the disposable income and this disposable income further fuel the economic growth in our country okay so this disposable income after 2030 also it's set to increase so therefore in this context we need to look into the consumer behavior of the people the consumer behavior will significantly influenced by the value of money or value for money now consumers have more money more disposable money so they will spend the money and that boost the demand in the economy and boost in the uh, uh, demand so that could further uh, drive or the fuel economic growth so after that we need to consider the growth of e-commerce in these tier 2 cities as well and e-commerce growth is particularly driven by the middle class in tier 2 and tier 3 cities so if you look at the kirana stores the overall kirana stores in these tier 2 cities there were around 15 million kirana stores and 88 percentage of the retail market that is present in india now if you look at the trends many of the families are coming come to stock up on fresh produce every 2 to 3 days so because of the middle class population and their disposable incomes so that would further give the philip to economic production or the economic growth now after that we need to look into the employment aspect of these tier 2 cities so as we have already understood that these tier 2 cities have been becoming uh, an important avenues for the entrepreneurship or firms are being attracted towards these tier 2 cities so these tier 2 cities have also providing gainful employment opportunities for the people okay so they have been providing gainful employment opportunities for the people now because of the gainful employment opportunities people from rural areas have been migrating to the urban areas or the tie to cities because it has been providing different avenues of the uh, for, for the employment now if you look at the cost of living in these tie to cities so it is you know considerably low when you compare it with the tier 1 cities so therefore it has been further giving philip to the greater consumption because the changing lifestyles of the people so they have the more disposable income and less cost of living and this has been giving further philip to the consumption by the middle class populations however the tier 2 cities have also been facing substantial amount of challenges so challenges in the sense that the infrastructure is not adequate to support the growing population and this has been leading to the growth of slums in these urban centers and if you look at the conditions with respect to sanitation and hygiene they are very poor in these urban centers so conditions like sanitation and hygiene are very poor and the urban local bodies are not adequately equipped to deal with any challenges in these tier 2 cities so all these challenges have been plaguing the tier 2 cities apart from that recently the urban floods so urban floods is also a most challenging phenomena that we can observe in these tier 2 cities
so therefore achieving infrastructure or the disaster resilience is also important for the uh, for ensuring that these tier 2 cities remain the major growth centers for india okay so this is how you can conclude the answer or you can also give the way forward or the suggestions for the above mentioned all the challenges so in this way you can conclude this answer now the next answer uh, is about the tribal populations and it is from the indian society part of paper 1 now the question is given the diversity is among the tribal communities in india so diversity is in terms of the cultures were different the languages the social practices were different so therefore we can say that the tribal populations have a, a wide diversity a huge diversity so even though they have a huge diversity so what are the ways you uh, in which you can say that they are a single category okay so in which specific context should they be considered as a single category and this question has to be written in just 150 words okay this is 10 mark question so firstly the government of india act so if you remember the government of india act so most of indian constitution has been derived from this act government of india act 1935 now the government of india act 1935 included the members of the community so they have been solely living or dependent on the forest and the forest resources now all these scheduled tribe populations were recognized by the government of india act 1935 as people who are living solely or dependent solely on forest and forest resources so this is a homogeneous category the government of india act 1935 has recognized the tribals as a homogeneous category now we need to understand that tribals have a broad diversity now uh, the broad diversity of tribals reflects in terms of the matriarchal castes okay matriarchal castes castes tribe now what is a matriarchal now uh, the matri matriarchal and the patriarchal are the social customs or the social uh, belief systems practiced in those respective tribes okay so in matriarchal uh, system the women members the women members of the tribal group have uh, the greater say in the uh, in different aspects when it when it comes to the patriarchal as uh, patriarchal system the male members of particular tribe has the greater say so this matriarchal can be observed in kasis who are living in meghalaya so kasi is a tribe kasis are tribe and the patriarchal system or the patriarchal tribes can be observed in rajasthan and gujarat so in this context so they also differ in terms of origin for example african origin siddhis they are living in gujarat and even they are living in parts of karnataka similarly there were indigenous tribes of andaman and nicobar islands so uh, sentinelis island so they were most famous or the most popular tribe so apart from the above mentioned the constitutional and the legal provisions that include sts as a single category okay the government of india act 1935 and other constitutional provisions which recognize sts as a single category so we can also uh, you know differentiate uh, between these type tribals between various socio economic grounds however we can also consider these tribes as a single category based on the socio economic grounds so firstly they are geographically isolated geographically isolated means most of the tribal people they don't want to mingle with the mainstream society so they don't want to interact with the mainstream society so most of them are geographically isolated and the best example is sentinelis sentinelis island in andaman and nicobar group of islands where sentinel tribe have been living and they don't want the outside interference or the interaction with the outsiders okay so they are strictly or the geographically isolated and they are remain confined to the sentinel island secondly these tribals have the religious practices so similar to tattoos they wear amulets jewelry and they also have a belief in the magic 
so because of this reason so the tattoos amulets jewelry reflects their respect to religious beliefs so after that it is very common that most of the tribal people have a worship uh, or uh, they have a nature worship as a common practice right from the indus valley civilization so during indus valley civilization also there were no evidence of any temple but we can see that they have the nature worship as a common practice so even now also most of the tribes in india have nature worship as a, a common practice and even tribes also worship their ancestors so their burial practices were different so these were uh, the common practices that make tribals as a homogeneous group of people in india now after that the tribals were mostly dependent on forest and forest resources so for their livelihood now in fact these forest uh, uh, living people or the tribals they collect the minor forest produce minor forest produce and these they sell the minor forest produce to travelers and even the government forest produce collection centers that were organized by the trifed so hence through collection of the minor forest produce that was being allowed by the government's forest rights act forest rights act so they they uh, you know earn their livelihoods and secondly this social structure is less stratified compared to the caste uh, and uh, you know compared to caste and have egalitarian structure now if you look at the modern indian society so it is you know segregated or differentiated into different caste class group of people based on their uh, you know uh, occupation profession everything but if you look at these tribals so most of the tribals socio uh, hierarchical structure is egalitarian in nature so you cannot find uh, the differences in these tribals so most of them are recognized as a homogeneous group of people and they are they are having an egalitarian structure and they also believe in animistic belief system so what does this animistic belief system exactly mean so the animistic belief system is every aspect in this universe has a life for example river a mountain a mountain a tree so everything they believe that everything has a life uh, you know inherent life and that belief is called as animistic belief system and this is the essence of conservation and protection of the natural resources so therefore it is believed that we need to make them part of the conservation and protection efforts so the community participation is very important particularly in the context of growing climate change and the degradation of the existing environment so therefore we need to integrate uh, the tribal communities in our policies which are envisioned for the conservation and protection of environment similarly most of the tribal groups so they are divided uh, or they are you know uh, located in a different territorial groups and they have dedicated to their own tribe and culture so most of these tribes are dedicated to their own tribe and culture because uh, their identity is their own tribe the clan and their culture and in fact so most of these tribal groups across the country have the primitive agricultural practices so uh, they practice hunting they collect the minor forest produce so still majority of these tribal communities also practice slash and burn cultivation method or shifting cultivation method so the primitive methods of farming primitive methods of farming so therefore still they have the primitive occupations so they have not yet adopted the modern methods of farming or modern lifestyles now if you look at the political organization of these tribal communities so these political organizations are mostly organized on the indigenous lines so the political organization is indigenous in nature that means that the council of elders 
so that is called as sabha council of elders is called as sabha is still prevalent in these tribal communities across india and sabhas samitis that we study in the vedic period were still practiced or the followed in these tribal communities strictly based on the matriarchal or the patriarchal system now the tribal society is mostly self reliant and self sufficient so their needs would be met by themselves only okay and even if you look at these tribal communities they even use the barter system so barter system doesn't involve the modern currency like coins and notes so they even practice the barter system so all these factors have been making indian tribals as a homogeneous group of people so it, despite differences uh you know uh, these things have been making as a one single group of people however in conclusion uh, you can write about the uh, the views of dr b r ambedkar so dr b r ambedkar has also advocated for their distinct socio religious and cultural practice and he rightly demanded to include them as a separate single and distinct category of people so that they are not being exploited and their spaces of living can be protected and their rights can be strengthened so this is what dr b r ambedkar has envisioned so uh, the map uh, you are seeing here it reflects major tribes who are living in different parts of our country for example you can see gaddis in uttarakhand and bill tribe in gujarat uh, sorry rajasthan todia tribe in gujarat santals in odisha okay chakmas in uh, the northeast so these are the major tribal uh, you know chenchus in andhra pradesh so major tribes who oh, which are living in different parts of uh, the country now uh, if you have time uh, please go through the different tribes who are living in the different states across india because that is very important for your prelims examination so go through the states and tribes uh, in which you are li- uh, they are living for example uh, if you look at the andaman and nicobar islands there were tribal people like uh, uh, there were tribal people like sentinelis onjes jerevas okay so there were different tribal groups who are living in these andaman nicobar islands so go through all the tribal groups in different parts of uh, or different states and the next question uh, that we are going to discuss is about the political and administrative reorganization of the states of uh, states in india okay so they have uh, continuously uh, reorganized so the question says that political and administrative reorganization of states and territories have has been a continuous or the ongoing process since the mid 19th century so in this context discuss this with the relevant examples so the maps you are so, uh, seeing here is a map of india in 1956 and the map of india in the year 2022 so you can observe you know the modification or the changes that were take place and that were taken place in both the maps right so if you look at hyderabad earlier it was a separate state okay so after the state reorganization act the hyderabad was merged with the andhra pradesh however hyderabad was separated from andhra pradesh uh, in the year 2014 itself okay so now uh, telangana is a different state and uh, andhra pradesh is a different state similarly if you look at uh, the uh, bombay presidency so bombay presidency uh, includes the parts of gujarat as well and gujarat in fact is separated into saurashtra kutch and the bombay presidency in the year 1956 so this is the basic difference between map that was in 1956 and map of uh, present times so therefore we can infer that the political and administrative reorganization of states and territories has been a, a continuous ongoing process since the mid 19th century okay so uh, it has been ongoing process so why there has been a continuous reorganization of states and territories it is particularly because to address various issues that were uh, resulted because of the linguistic 
and cultural diversities among the people so there were a uh, huge linguistic and cultural diversities for example uh, if you look at the state of andhra pradesh so that was formed from the madras presidency in the year 1956 because of the linguistic uh, differences similarly uh, if you look at the punjab and haryana separation so they were separated in the year 1966 particularly because of the cultural differences and there were also states that were formed because of the administrative efficiency reasons and also regional development for example telangana was formed in the year 2014 particularly because of lack of regional development administrative efficiency there were uh, states like uttarakhand jharkhand so they were formed because of the administrative efficiency requirements or the needs now we need to uh, understand or uh, we need to discuss about the reorganization the administrative and the political reorganization of the territory zone of india with the examples since the mid 19th century so this is mid 19th century now firstly british india so uh, that was uh, in india since 1958 to 1947 so uh, after the revolt of uh, you know 1857 the nature of the british administration has changed okay so it the nature of the british administration has changed so if you look at the 1859 1947 british rule the colonial administration has also initiated the process of reorganizing Uh, territories so one best example was separation of bengal as east bengal and west bengal so east bengal and west bengal were separated in order to curb or curtail the rise of national movement or the nationalistic sentiment that has been primarily originating from originating from the bengal uh, uh, province okay so they have uh, divided this primarily on the administrative purposes but the real reason was to consolidate their rule and to diversify uh, on to, uh, you know uh, the overcome the nationalistic sentiment that has been generated in the bengal province so the bengal has been divided into two provinces east bengal west bengal in the year 1950 1905 so however after the separation of east bengal and west bengal uh, in the year 19 Uh, 11 itself 1911 itself so uh, the uh, both uh, this uh, attempt was annulled because of the widespread protests in after the partition of bengal followed by the swadeshi movement in 1905 so of post independence also we have seen the reorganization of the uh, you know administrative reorganization of states and union territories So after India gained independence in the year 1947 the process of reorganization or reorganizing states has uh, union territories further continued because of we have uh, a living in a, a country with a diverse linguistic and cultural groups that led to more and more demands and the 1956 state reorganization act was passed and this particular act has led to the creation of 14 states plus 6 union territories so this was primarily based on the linguistic lines so these states were created on the linguistic lines secondly the linguistic reorganization has also took place in the year 1956 so uh, based on the linguistic reorganization states like andhra pradesh were formed so this reorganization is primarily on the basis of different languages in a particular province or the presidency okay so the andhra pradesh state was created in 1953 however the andhra pradesh uh, andhra state that was called as andhra state without telangana or hyderabad is known as andhra state and that was formed in the year 1953 and in 1956 andhra pradesh was formed it has led to the beginning of a linguistic reorganization of states in india secondly based on the administrative efficiency also uh, in 1960s there were uh, different states that were uh, formed okay so uh, the main reason for the formation of these states is a better administrative efficiency and the regional development so because they are considered as backward states they lack infrastructure they lack the efficient administration 
so they lack the efficient administration so therefore the formation of smaller states like uttarakhand jharkhand and chatisgarh they were formed in the year 2000 and they aim to improve the governance and promote the regional development okay so however even though these states were formed they still lagging behind in terms of development uh, infrastructure development and uh, human development and uh, the efficient governance and administrative systems so recently there were also a reorganization of states for example the erstwhile jammu and kashmir state was separated into the union territories of jammu and kashmir and ladakh so they were being separated by the jammu and kashmir reorganization act 2019 okay so this is also very significant in recent reorganization since the question has been very specifically asked you to write examples it is very important that in each point you must mention one such example so that you can get good marks similarly uh, in conclusion so you can just uh, you know summarize everything you have written in the body part of the answer so in conclusion the political and administrative reorganization of states and territories in india has been ongoing process since the mid 19th century so it has been an ongoing process so how it has been an ongoing process we have understood right from the british rule up to the recent reorganization of jammu and kashmir uh, state so therefore the process primarily has been driven by the linguistic factors cultural factors and the need for better administration good governance and the regional development okay so the uh, the reorganization of states and union territories has played a crucial role in shaping india's political landscape and addressing diverse needs of india's population so this is how you can conclude the answer and the image given here Uh, shows that how india was in the year 1951 okay so you know so you can see the map of uh, different states in india is different from what it is now so they were uh, uh, different uh, you know princely states like ajmer travancore kurg mysore so over a period of time it has been led to the consolidation consolidation formation of different states and this is an ongoing process with changing needs of the society changing needs of the people we can also see the continuous reorganization and reformation of different parts of our country so in the 1940 uh, 1951 there were around 29 administrative divisions so that was as per 1951 census however in the year 1956 state reorganization act that takes effect and 14 states and 6 union territories were formed in the year 1956 so 1966 the uh, punjab was split into haryana and punjab so uh, uh, pondi uh, sorry this chandigarh was uh, a common capital or the union territory for both the states similarly in 1954 all french regions which uh, were part of india for example puducherry was part of french territory in india so they were become part of india now north east was also recognized uh, north east particularly arunachal pradesh was got separated from assam in the year 1972 so uh, till 1957 it was a union territory in 1957 arunachal pradesh has become a state similarly different north east states and they become uh, states in different periods of time so this is how india's political and administrative reorganization of states and different territories has taken place so the next question uh, is about the contributions of gupta period and chola period in the heritage and culture see this is one of the most important question that is continuously repeated by the upsc so if you look at the previous year questions of upsc mains examination upsc has already asked about gupta coinage system gupta coinage system and even the chola nataraja bronze sculpture nataraja bronze sculpture so therefore 
it is also repeated in the year 2022 so therefore in this context please understand the gupta age and the chola age or the chola dynasty is very important for the upsc examination now if you uh, understand the gupta empire so it is considered as one of the golden periods in entire ancient indian history golden periods why because it has made a remarkable progress in terms of art architecture science and technology metallurgy philosophy in every dimension it has made a remarkable progress so because of this region gupta period is known as a, a golden period of ancient indian history similarly uh, if you look at the chola empire it is also one of the most important and most crucial empire so because this is rightly called as the socratic the socratic Thalassocratic, sorry, Thalassocratic uh, Empire. Thalassocratic means it has a maritime supremacy. Maritime supremacy and even these Cholas were called as Imperial Cholas because their empire was extended even to the Southeast Asia. So they were the Thalassocratic Empire and they have a significant contribution in terms of heritage and culture. And Chola Empire is considered as one of the la longest surviving dynasty in the world. So this is uh, the way to introduce this answer. So this temple uh, you are seeing here is Tanjauru Bruhadeshwar Alayam. Okay, so that was built by Rajaraja Chola. And in, in the right you can see the uh, bronze statue of Nataraja belong to the Chola period. So the coin of Gupta Empire, the gold coin. So uh, if you look at the contributions of the Guptas, so they have uh, made a remarkable contribution in terms of culture and heritage, uh, particularly in the field of literature, temple building, science and technology, philosophy, sculpture, painting and Puranas. Okay, so in literature, most famous poets like Kalidasa, Basa, Sudraka and Harisena, they belong to the Gupta period. So they adorned the courts of Gupta kings and the most famous nine gems were also belong to Chandragupta II, the court of Chandragupta II. So apart from uh, these things, uh, the Sanskrit literature and Prakrit were also popularized and patronized by the kings of Gupta period. So this was very famous, the Sanskrit and Prakrit was very famous in Gupta times. Similarly, so the five groups of temple structures or the temples, structural temples were evolved during the Gupta period. So science and technology was also made a remarkable progress because Aryabhatta, Varahamihira, Nagarjuna, so one of the most prominent scientists, still India celebrates them. So they were most important personalities and they have made a remarkable contributions when it comes to mathematics, astronomy, medicine, metallurgy. So in all these fields, scientific fields, there were remarkable scientific advancements. And the six fields of philosophy were also developed during this uh, Gupta period. So these philosophies were Samkhya, Yoga, Mimamsa, Vaisheshika, Nyaya and Vedanta. So these philosophies are also important for your uh, prelims examination. So please, uh, you know, read about these philosophies in a detailed way. So six, uh, after that, this sculpture was also very famous. The stone sculpture of Buddha from Saranath or in Saranath belonged to the Gupta a period and even the great boar or the varaha at the entrance of Udaigiri caves in Odisha also belong to the Gupta period. Now painting was also popularized and patronized by the kings of Gupta period. The mural paintings that we found in Ajanta, Bagh and other rock cut caves belong to the Gupta age. So Puranas, originally these Puranas were composed of baths and they were finally modified or uh, rewritten by the Brahmins or the priests belong to the Gupta period and they have written these Puranas in classical Sanskrit language. Now if you look at the contribution of Cholas, they have they also have the remarkable contribution in temple building, sculpture, painting, dance, music, everything. So uh, if you look at the temple building, 
the dravidan style of temple architecture has reached its peak for example the tanjavur brahmeshwar uh, temple that was built by raj raja secondly the sculptures uh, that we are seeing for example the bronze sculpture of nataraja the stone and metal sculptures that were that we can found around these chola temples the, they were very famous and these sculptures essentially revolve around the socio religious ideas of the chola period okay so the nataraja bronze sculpture was very famous for its beauty and its spiritual significance now in fact the scenes from ramayan mahabharata puran uh, and the lives of 50 63 nayan mars were sculpted in the narrative panels on temple walls as a sculptures and so if you look at the chola paintings they were realistic in nature so most of these paintings are realistic in nature and scenes from periya puranam are beautifully depicted uh, as paintings now music was also got popularized uh, in every temple the alwar and nayanmar hymns were sung alwar and nayanmars were a different uh, vaishnavite and shaivite sects and uh, these songs these uh, hymns were sung across these temples so tanjavur brahmeshwar temple uh, have has several musicians so that were being appointed by the chola rulers so in the musical instruments like drums uh, udukkai veena and flute were very well known musical instruments during chola times so if you look at the dance uh, uh, so uh, chola period there were two types of dances bharatanatyam that is one of the uh, classical languages in india and the kathakali that is originally belong to kerala so chola rulers have patronized uh, both bharatanatyam and kathakali and uh, in one such dance called karana dance lord shiva was depicted as a performer and in rama uh, uh, during festivals uh, dramas were used to perform for example raj rajeshwara natakam and raj raja vijayam so these were two major dramas that were performed during festivals so in fact there was another type of drama which is called kutu which has sub uh, you know dramas for example arya kutu chakki kutu santi kutu so they were all mentioned in the inscriptions that were being issued by these chola rulers and this is uh, all for uh, today's discussion and uh, tomorrow also we will be discussing few more questions and uh, how we can uh, structure those answers so please stay with us and subscribe to our youtube channel and also hit the bell icon if you like our videos thank you